Holly Randall Unfiltered is brought to you by our friends at Manscaped. Their Lawnmower 3.0 is a revolutionary electric trimmer that won't nick or snag your nuts. So go to manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Today, I have Sarah J, adult performer, producer, and recently ex-biz cam MILF social media star. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> How are you? I'm fantastic. Thank you. Um, so, you know, you and I have, have been in the industry a long time, and You've always been somebody that's had like such a big presence in the adult industry. Um, you're insanely popular. You have a huge following. So I guess let's start from the beginning. And why don't you tell me about how you get started in the industry? Um, and also, guys, I'm really sorry about the birds chirping in the background, but I think they built a nest in the air conditioning vent. So you're just going to have to. <laughs> deal with it. Just pretend we're out in nature. But anyways, um, yeah. How did you get a, how did you get into the adult industry in the first place? Um, well, I was working a lot of jobs and my husband suggested I started dancing so I didn't have to work as hard. And I danced for a really long time. Um, but I moved from like the Midwest to Las Vegas. And once I did, dancing got really challenging. Like there's so many more girls, there's so many more customers, there's so many more variables and like different types of like people you have to deal with. So um, I kind of like looked at that and said, what do I really love about, you know, dancing? And what can I take from that to uh, form another career? And, you know, I love sex. I love being viewed as a sex object. It was like a really exciting thing for me to explore considering I was always like a little bit nerdy tomboy. And, um, yeah, I decided that I wanted to do porn. So um, I reached out to as many people as I could get a hold of and just kept sending my pictures to emails that I would find. And um, once I got a hold of a photographer that was um, the producer of the Exotic Dancer Awards in Las Vegas, and he kind of like connected me with a lot of people, which kind of just snowballed. And, uh, yeah, here I am. <laughs> so I'm going to assume that since your husband suggested that you get into dancing, he was okay with you getting into adult. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we had a really good relationship when it comes to trust and, uh, yeah, he knew that I had a really good business mind and head on my shoulders. And, uh, he was like, if that's what you want to do, do it. That's fantastic. I mean, so many people don't have the luxury of having a partner that feels that way. Um, did you guys ever run into like any jealousy issues and, and did you, how'd you work that out? Yeah. You know, um, I think we both were often jealous of each other for different reasons, you know, maybe not necessarily being in the adult industry, but just, um, different opportunities that each, and he, you know, there's moments where I was jealous of him too. Like he did security and sometimes he would do security for really fun stuff, you know, and like he would be doing security like all weekend and I would be at the strip club working or whatever, you know, I'm like, Ugh. so, um, yeah, like we definitely had our problems and we ended up getting divorced. We were married for 11 years, but, um, I don't really attribute that to the adult industry. I just felt like our lives went kind of like in different directions. Like mm -hmm. he's much more of a homebody than I am. And um, especially at that time, I was still pretty young. Like we got married at 19 and I just wanted to explore all my opportunities and kind of explore the world. And he wasn't really interested in coming with me. So yeah, it was like, yeah, I would go out and do all kinds of fun stuff and then come back and he's just chilling, you know? <laughs> yeah. I really, yeah. yeah. I kind of wanted a partner in crime. So like Bonnie and Clyde with me, but it just didn't really work out. Yeah. Well, that is really young to get married. And it you is. know, I, all I had a starter marriage and, uh, you know, I'm married for the second time now, um, to the father of my child and, you know, 
Like there was a lot of things about that first marriage that taught me about what I want in a partner, what I don't want in a partner. So I, I don't regret it. Um, yeah. Plus we both changed over 11 years. Mm-hmm. You know, those are like, you know, really important years. So between totally. 19 and 30, you change a lot. <laughs> oh my God. So much, yeah. <laughs> so much. So as, uh, you just mentioned, you started in the industry when you were quite young. Um, so I think it's safe to say that, that you are a veteran, so how has the industry changed since you started? And do you think it's better now or worse now or like a mixed bag? It has changed in so many ways. I mean, technology and just like the structure of our industry, like everything has changed. It's not the same business at all. Um, and I do think it is for the better. You know, like uh, when I first started, I always like to tell the young people about like Polaroids and film <laughs> and uh you know like I, I would do like a four or five hour photo shoot and the photographer would come in with a cooler full of little 35 millimeter film rolls you know um yeah like even when I got started I had my husband take Polaroid pictures of me I took those Polaroids to the library where I scanned them onto a floppy disk and then took that <laughs> floppy disk like with me you know so, um, oh yeah, days. lots of things have changed. You know, we used to like for the first few years that I was doing porn, we shot on DV8 tapes instead of digital, you know, so everything has changed as far as technology. Um, all these consumer goods uh, and consumer um, technologies have been available to us. So that way we can shoot really great content um, with cheap lights and, you know, even our phone. Um, so that's great. And then all these services that have come up, everything between like, you know, phone sex and text messaging and camming, those have all gotten really popular and that's great extra income. And then also you've got all the clip sites and the tube sites and all these different things that, um, creators can upload their own content. So it kind of like takes out the middleman a lot, which is great because in my opinion, performers never really got paid what they're worth. You know, you only get, you know, what you get for your scene, unless you're like a producer and then you get, you know, some residuals, but it's nice to be able to take out the middleman and get your money directly from the fans and, uh, let the fans speak for themselves as opposed to like a, you know, company that may be filled with people that may not be your fan. (laughs) Yeah. And you've always had such a big following and such a strong fan base. So now that they have this kind of direct access to you, have you seen just your income like shoot up? Because I must imagine that, you know, you must have like, I don't, you probably have an OnlyFans. I mean, I assume everyone oh, does, yeah, I've got but you probably fans. have like so many people that are just so excited that they actually get to interact with you now on a, an actual genuine level. Yeah, you know, I saw my first boost with like, you know, the coming of like porn and the internet together. So when I started, you know, there wasn't hardly any porn sites online. I think the only one I could really think of is Danny's hard drive, to be honest with you. But as far as like, you know, paid sites, there wasn't really a lot of porn sites. So um, once I started working for a lot more internet companies after I'd been in the business a few years, uh, That really boosted my fan base because the fans were able to speak, you know, and people started paying attention to lists and to what the fans wanted online and like social media allowed me to connect and, um, you know, numbers, numbers are super important in this business, you know? Um, so if I was to, you know, go work for a large company or attempt to get hired by a large company and the, you know, group that does the hiring does not like thick white women, then, you know, I would be not, I wouldn't have that opportunity, but if they go online and they see that, you know, I've got these crazy numbers and that people are talking about me and people want to see me, then it gives me more opportunity. So that was like my first boost was when the internet came about. And then, um, I think like the next boost was uh, like social media where I was able to interact on a regular basis with my fan base and they could kind of get a vibe for my personality a little bit more. And then I think the third wave is like um, all of these like services and clip sites and clip stores and stuff because, you know, I can just make my money direct. You know, what's so interesting about what you just said about, you know, 
a producer maybe not hiring you because they don't like thick white woman, but yet, <laughs> you know, you have these, these big numbers. And what I have found watching the internet grow and watching the way social media has changed, has shaped marketing and shaped the way that brands kind of direct, um, you know, their direction is that, mm-hmm. I, I mean, you and I, I think we're like the same age, you know, yeah. I grew up believing that people only liked like skinny girls, you know? And mm-hmm. I, I remember, you know, I have big thighs and I remember in high school, like being called thunder thighs and like wishing I was so much skinnier, which is hilarious because I was literally like 30 pounds skinnier than I am now. And I like, yeah, it was that. And, and now you see all of these brands embracing bigger women. You see that with the internet, the way that it's opened up people's access to whatever they actually like, rather than what the media tells them that they like and tells them that they should buy, that there's so much more diversity. And, you know, now it's like thick thighs save lives. I'm like, where was that when I was in high school? (laughs) Yeah, no, even take it beyond like size, even like tattoos, you know, I remember driving like four hours to a photo shoot. And once I got there, I was told that I wouldn't be shot because I had too many tattoos. And for that to stop a photo shoot at this point is like laughable. Like I've got so many fans all over the planet. They could care less that I have tattoos and some of them might even like it. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's like tattoo specific websites and brands. I mean, you know, everyone's got a tattoo these days and, Mm -hmm. and along those lines, like same thing, you know, back in the two thousands when I was like working for my mom, you know, we, we, I mean, I'll be honest, like we didn't want to hire girls with tattoos. Yeah, for sure. Now it's like, good luck finding someone without a tattoo. Like that just doesn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. Like everyone has tattoos. It's very much, you know, the, the new culture and, and that's great that people can now kind of finally do with their bodies what they want to and and still be able to market themselves. Yeah. I think a lot of that, you know, it's just been brought on by the people being able to speak their mind online and us being able to listen. Yeah. People, um, you know, voting with their wallets, as they say. Exactly. So, uh, you have, as we just discussed, uh, you have an enormous dedicated fan base. Um, you've built your career on being genuine, enthusiastic, and truly enjoying sex. And, uh, you say that you don't do anything that you don't love. How have you maintained that enthusiasm through the years? I don't know, to be honest with you. I think I just really actually like sex. Like I have a lot of personal life sex too. Like it's not just like on camera. Like I just like sex. Like it's fun. Um, I guess just keeping it fresh and interesting, you know, and not doing anything that I don't want to do. I think that jades people a lot and, um, really kind of makes them, you know, just angry all over at the industry and, uh, resentful, you know? So I think if keeping that like positive attitude, uh, is easy when you're doing things that you like to do. And do you find that you love your job now more that you are more in control of your own content and you have your own production company now? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I get to work with who I want when I want for the most part. And um, I still work for other companies and stuff too, but it's nice to be able to create your own scenarios and to write your own scripts and to, to cast your own productions and then also get the feedback direct from the fans from that. That's great. What are some of your favorite scenes to shoot? Uh, I think I like threesomes the best specifically. Like I, I love the dynamics between three people. So it's, it's fun to shoot those and, um, to put three people together that might not like know each other and like, you know, see what happens when they, their, you know, characters mix. It's, it's kind of exciting. And do you have any favorite performers that you like to work with? Uh, you know, over the years, I always like to work with like Lexington Steel. Him and I always had really great chemistry. Um, Ava Divine and I have always been really good friends. But even like recently, I've like, you know, found um, a lot of fun with like Aubrey Black and Karen Fisher. You know, we all have a good time on set and it's fun. King Noir, you know, so um, 
yeah, yeah, I'm always finding new like friends to work with. It's really, it's really good when you have like some chemistry and some like background before you get on set, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, have you ever felt pressured to do like a scene that you didn't want to do? I mean, you, you talk about how, you know, you don't do anything that you don't love, but did you ever find yourself in a situation maybe early in your career where somebody was trying to get you to do something or you ended up doing a scene that you kind of regretted doing later? Sure. Um, but not very often. Like I'm, I'm a big fan of the word no. <laughs> and I really don't do things for money. So like money isn't ever been a pressure for me. Um, but I, you know, I remember one day I was scheduled to do a bunch of solo scenes. It was like, I was going to shoot and we we're going to do like three or four solo scenes. And when I get there and this is like early in my career, I look at the scripts or the like list of scenes. And one was like a smoking fetish. And um, I had a problem with cigarettes for like a long time. Like I started smoking cigarettes when I was 12 and I quit when I was 24. And this was probably like maybe six months after I quit. So it was still like a challenge a little bit for me. And um, I remember standing in the bathroom, like thinking like, what am I going to do? Like, do I do it? I mean, it wasn't that long ago that I had a cigarette in my hand for free, you know? And yeah. like, should I just go ahead and do it? Can, am I strong enough to like hold on to this cigarette and, and, you know, not get back into the habit of it? I, I was super upset, but I did it. Um, because I did believe that I was strong enough to handle it, but I was like miserable the whole time and nobody probably even notices it. But like when I watch that scene, I'm like, Oh God, don't ever do anything you're miserable doing. Cause it's like, it shows all over your face. You know, like I'm one of those people, like if I'm like upset, it shows. And I could mm -hmm. tell I was like miserable during that whole scene. And that kind of like, because it happened early in my career, I was like, okay, don't ever do that again. Don't ever do yeah. anything that makes you sad. <laughs> yeah. You can see it. Yeah. Yeah. I know the smoking fetish is, is we used to shoot a lot of that. Um, I haven't shot it in a long time. I very much dislike cigarettes, but I do have people requested a lot, especially my mom was, was known for doing like really great smoking fetish stuff. And it, it does like look really cool on camera. Um, but you know, if there's a scene that ever calls for it, I always check with the model to, to make sure that they smoke because if you don't smoke, it's, it, it burns your throat. It makes you cough. It makes you feel sick. Like it's just yeah. terrible. Or if you have a problem, it could like, you know, just like any other drug, it could just like resurface too. That's what mm -hmm. I was like most worried about. Yeah. If I do smoking fetish now, I do it with like a hookah. So that way you can still have yeah. like the smoke and stuff, but I don't have to smoke a cigarette. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's also like vape pens, which actually just, right. you know, there's so much more smoke, even though it's water vapor coming right. out that, that looks pretty cool. Mm-hmm. All right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break. We're going to come back and we are going to talk more about Sarah's YouTube channel and so much more. So hang tight. Got Bush? You definitely do if you haven't started using the products from my sponsor, Manscaped. Since I've started working with Manscaped, they've really expanded on their product line. It's incredible. So of course we've got the Lawnmower 3.0, their revolutionary electric body trimmer, which is not only cordless, but it's also waterproof. So you can actually use it in the shower. They also have the Crop Preserver and the Crop Reviver, a ball deodorant and a ball toner to keep your balls smelling nice and fresh. And if you get their perfect package, you will not only get the aforementioned ball toner and ball deodorant, but you will also get, of course, the electric trimmer, a shed travel bag, and their boxer briefs, which are the most comfortable boxer briefs you will ever wear. You can get all of this for 20% off at manscaped.com by using my code HRU. That's 20% off at manscaped.com by using my code HRU. All right, guys, we are back. So Sarah, along with so many other performers these days who now have the means to pursue other avenues besides adult, I know you have your own CBD line, you have your own production company, mm -hmm. and you have your own YouTube channel, and you're getting into NFTs. So let's start with your CBD line. Tell us a little bit about that and how that all started. 
Um, I have a CBD line. We have three products as of right now. I have a bath bomb uh, called Time Out. I have a sex lube called Long Night. And I have a massage oil called Long Day. And uh, the massage oil and the bath bomb come in eucalyptus and lavender. Um, they both have really high quality CBD in them. Um, CBD is great for uh, inflammation. And it really acts as a sleep aid a lot of times too. Um, it can be like a muscle relaxant and it's legal, you know, which is super important to a lot of people. Sometimes people don't want to be high. And, you know, even though CBD comes from cannabis, it doesn't get you high. Um, CBD is something you can give children, you can give grandparents, and um, it's totally safe and harmless. And it's a space that I wanted to get into because um, I've always been a supporter of the cannabis community, but I also recognize that like there's a lot of benefits to cannabis that um, people aren't taking advantage of because they don't want to be high or they don't want to do anything against the law. So CBD is the perfect outlet for that. It's kind of amazing how marijuana is recreationally legal in not in all states, but in some states. I remember in high school, my boyfriend wrote a paper on like the DuPont industry and basically how they kind of crushed, um, you know, legalizing marijuana. And I remember him saying to me, like, one day marijuana is going to be legal. And I was like, no, it's not. <laughs> and now it is. It's so crazy. Yeah, like yeah. how, yeah, I mean, was that change just as surprising for you as it was for me? Yeah. You know, um, it's happened over a very long period of time. If you think about it, I mean, we're, we're up there in age now and that's over about 20 years, you know, it's happened, but, um, yeah, I'm now I stand where we're at today and I look back at the past 20 years and I'm like, wow. Yeah. 20 years ago, I never would have guessed it, but it's like little baby steps, little baby steps. And now, um, you know, even some States have legalized, uh, a lot of other drugs too. Like, you know, I know Oregon and Washington DC both have legalized pretty much all drugs or decriminalized them. So that's, um, it's, I think it's like a step in the right direction, you know, like I really do. Uh, I've always been a big fan of, um, the policy of, you know, making drugs legal, uh, you know, selling drugs might not be legal. And I get that. That makes sense. Um, regulations and, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. But if you're doing drugs and you're not causing anybody any harm, why are you against the law? You know, <laughs> yeah. so th like, there's progressive countries like Portugal, for example, and they have gotten rid of their drug policy like entirely. And if they see somebody um, outside doing drugs, the police or the authorities will come to them and be like, do you need any help? Here's some information in case you change your mind, you know, um, which I think is like much more progressive and um, proactive than our drug policies. The war on drugs has stopped a lot of research and has stopped a lot of um, scientific progression. So now that we have that lifted, at least on marijuana, they're able to pull out the CBD, they're able to pull out the CBN, they're able to separate all these chemicals because they've been able to do research on it and they've been able to um, manipulate it and make it better and more consumable for everybody. Yeah. And, you know, by taking away the criminal element behind drugs, then you're, you know, you end up essentially erasing the black market which lowers crime. And, you know, there's so many people that are in jail for like low level drug offenses, Absolutely. you know, and, and the prison system here is a whole, whole other thing. But, um, you know, and, and so me personally, I'm actually a recovering alcoholic and I can't take anything like I, I, I have such an addictive personality, but I also agree that we should decriminalize um, drugs, legalize drugs. I'm all for like the marijuana industry. I can't smoke it because just, but you know, that's my own personal makeup, but I, I see yeah. that it really works for yep. some other people. And, you know, I can tell you from personal experience that alcohol is extremely destructive. I mean, it almost oh, yeah. destroyed my life. So, you know, to say that like, okay, we're going to have alcohol be legal, but like all of these other things can't be legal. Like, 
you know, alcohol destroys people all the time. But again, like that's not the fault of alcohol. I don't think alcohol should be illegal. There's plenty of people who can enjoy alcohol responsibly. I'm just not one of those people. So yep. therefore I can't personally take it, but you know, I take personal responsibility for my own issues. Um, but I, I, I do agree with you that, you know, and, and there's been, you know, some really interesting research that's coming around with like microdosing with acid and mushrooms and how it's like helping yeah. with depression and anxiety. And I just feel like we're on a brink of being able to discover methods, you know, like kind of non-pharmaceutical methods of mm -hmm. helping people treat their mental disorders without all these crazy fucking antidepressants that people are on that, you know, can sometimes make people suicidal, um, make people worse. So it's a really yeah. exciting time for sure. Yeah. Even my dentist quit dentistry so he could, <laughs> uh, open up a, a ketamine clinic. Oh, wow. Yeah. So he does what he calls ketitations. It's like ketamine meditations and it's a, a gray legal space right now, I guess. So, um, yeah, like I, when you make things legal, it opens up everything for possibilities of education and research and advancement, you know? Mm -hmm. So let's talk about your YouTube channel, uh, sarahj.tv, right? Yeah, it's sarahj.tv. Mm -hmm. And um, you have an impressive over 300,000 subscribers, which is like more than double what I have. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously it's doing really well. So tell us a little bit about what kind of videos you do on YouTube, because obviously we all know they must be like super safe for work. So like yeah. what kind of content are you creating on that platform? It's a challenge. You can't even as an adult star, like we are like got some sort of label on us. I can't even have a, like adult humor sometimes on my channel. So it's been like a super challenge with YouTube, but I create mostly comedy skits on there, you know, things that um, happen to me and that I think other people can relate to. And um, it's been really fun, but the YouTube regulations have like just squashed everything. So that would, my YouTube page is in a hold pattern currently. <laughs> yeah. Oh, like, man. uh, just trying to create content that is not going to get taken off. And of course they took all my monetization away. Like, and my page is incredibly clean. Like I'm practically wearing turtlenecks, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so wait, did they completely like remove all possibilities of monetization or did they just put limited ads on everything? No, they removed my monetization. And this is like the second time they've removed my monetization, like adult humor, even like, you know, and if I wasn't an adult star, I could be doing the, not even doing things, just saying things and it wouldn't be a big deal. But because I'm an adult star, it's like an issue. You know, I obviously have a YouTube channel and yeah, I struggle with what the rules are because you know, I try, I mean, obviously my podcasts are not clean. Like, you know, I want people to be able to speak freely and a lot of times limited ads are run on my interviews, which is fine. But then also too, sometimes I actually had this happen recently where YouTube went back and fully monetized some videos that had like really explicit content in it. And I was like, I don't Weird. understand why, why this is okay. But then I'll have an interview with somebody who's an adult star, but we'll talk about something completely not adult related, like whatsoever. And they'll put limited ads on that. So I'm always like, I'm always so confused as to what the rules are. And I'm terrified of getting deleted because I had my first channel get deleted like a long so time ago. <laughs> and I worked so hard to get monetized. And so like, yeah, I always feel like I'm stepping on eggshells, mm -hmm. which I think everyone in our industry feels on all social media platforms, it's like, you don't know what you're going to do. That's going to get you thrown out because it seems to be so arbitrary. Yeah. You know, I've actually got a lot of skits and clips that I've already shot. I'm just like scared to put them up. Like I would like to try to get my monetization back before I put them back up. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, you know, like I've appealed it a couple of times and they just don't really tell you what's wrong always, you know, like mm -hmm. I've gone through and deleted things and yeah, it's just, it's a challenge, but the stuff that's out there is really funny and it's really good and you should check it out, you know, and I, I hope one day to be able to put more stuff on there. <laughs> <laughs> 
Wow. Um, okay, guys, we are going to take one more commercial break, and then we're going to come back and talk about Sarah's foray into NFTs. And if you don't know what NFTs are, you're going to find out. So hang tight. Damn it, I said it again. I was going to come up with a different one. After these messages, we'll be right back. If you're here, it's probably because you're a fan of my podcast, Holly Randall Unfiltered. Well, that's great because I'm a fan of my podcast too. Now, if you don't know what Patreon is, it's a crowdfunding platform that allows people to make contributions on a monthly basis. Because this podcast costs money to make, maybe even more so than others. I'm obsessed with quality. So since the beginning, I have always recorded in a studio, had a professional sound engineer, and recorded professional video. All of these things cost money, as you can imagine. And I also made a pretty scary decision this year to cut down on my directing gigs so that I could focus more on this podcast, which is why I need your help now more than ever. But don't worry, I'm not asking you to give me something for nothing. In exchange for your contributions, I offer so many perks. For example, access to the live streams of all of my interviews, a bonus podcast that I do called My LA Porn Life, Q and A's where the stars answer your specific questions, behind the scenes interviews, merchandise such as mugs, shirts, and stickers, access to my private Snapchat, and so much more. You can join for as little as $5 a month and help me change the way the world sees the adult industry and sex work. So take a look around and see everything that I have to offer. I really hope that you'll join and be a part of our little community. All right, guys, we are back. We're going to talk about NFTs, which are non-fungible tokens. And Sarah J has jumped on this latest electronic trend, and it is it is being talked about a lot now. I'm kind of looking at it and maybe getting into it. So Sarah, can you explain to our audience what NFTs are and specifically what it is that you are selling online? Yep. I will do my best. It's um, sometimes it's a challenge to wrap your mind around something that's not tangible, but um, an NFT non-fungible token, as you said, um, is generally a piece of art or uh, often like a video, a GIF, um, a clip, um, some sort of photo, um, often animated in some kind of way. And it's digital art that can only um, be viewed digitally. Uh, you can't hold it, touch it. Um, but with that piece of art, uh, you can sell it as um, you know, one of one, or you can duplicate it and sell it to numerous people, and it'll go up for auction on a marketplace. And um, it creates a ledger where uh, the people's name is attached to the NFT. So um, part of the NFT is also the people who own the NFT previously, which is kind of cool. Um, and yeah, it's like an auction. You use um, Ether, which is on the Ethereum network, to uh, purchase it. So you just go over to your wallet. You switch out some dollars for some Ether. You go over to my NFT link. And uh, you bid on the NFT. And then um, a lot of NFTs will come with some sort of experience with it, whether it's um, a physical experience or a tangible experience. You know, like I, because NFT not being tangible, and it is challenging for a lot of people to like wrap their mind around, some NFTs are now coming with some sort of tangible thing. Like my NFT comes with a t shirt that uh, I'm signing. So, um, not only do you get the one of one NFT called Liberty's Retribution, but you also get a signed T-shirt. Yeah. So I guess what they are instituting into is like a blockchain. I think yeah. they call it a blockchain, which is essentially like a digital signature so that, yeah, it, there's track of when it transfers ownership and it, and it verifies that it's really like a one of one piece. Mm -hmm. And it is a hard thing to wrap your head around because, you know, it is an untangible product and it's like, well, I could just see it online anyways, but it's like, yeah, but you don't like own it. So right. it's interesting to see like where this is going to go, but you know, some yeah. things have been auctioned for like enormous amounts of money. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> it and, is. um, 
And I think it's also interesting too, that you can only buy it with cryptocurrency, which I think is also like another um, kind of peek into our future of, of currency and how, how yeah. that's going to work. And, you know, cryptocurrency is great in a way that it's not like tied to the government. Um, yeah. And I think it's especially something that will be helpful for the adult industry because, you know, we run into so many problems with Visa MasterCard processing, um, with, you know, the government stigma and the government, yep. um, creating so many problems for us. But I kind of, so I was, I've been thinking about like NFTs a lot and I'm thinking about, okay, you know, if you have a piece of art, you would want to like hang it in your house, right? So for people to see. And so I'm kind of envisioning this future where, you know, you have these really rich art collectors who maybe, you know, have several houses all over the world. Yeah. And I feel like there, there's going to be some kind, maybe it exists already, but some kind it of like electronic frame. It already exists. It uh, okay, exists. right. I've, yeah, yeah, I'm I not original. To, um, I just went to the Bitcoin convention here in Miami this week. It was like the largest Bitcoin convention in the world. And they had an NFT um, show, show area. And um, not only did they have like basically like mo TV monitors, kind of like a big digital frame showing the NFTs, but um, after getting some education while I was there, they make monitors for NFTs now where like if you are a collector, you really only need one frame and then mm -hmm. it'll cycle through your NFTs. So let's say mm -hmm. you connect that one frame to your um, your NFT collection that's online and then it'll just cycle through them so you can see them always it's kind of like those um vir those uh virtual frames that you buy like for your grandmother that you could like just yes. upload like pictures of your kids too. You know what I mean? Exactly. They're always trying to sell I, you at Christmas. Yep. I've got one of those for my mom. <laughs> <laughs> but like way fancier. But yeah, I mean I could see people, you know, like oh, I'm gonna go for my house in Spain and then, you know, go to my house in Martha's Vineyard. And rather than like having to transport expensive mm -hmm. art, I'm just gonna then project it onto my frames over there. And then you don't have to transport the art. It can never be destroyed. Um, Such good points. Yes. Yeah. So, you know, there's some upsides to it, but it is, it is interesting. It's, I'm really interested to see where it's going to go. And uh, you're on the OpenSea network, which is something that I was also looking into. So if you guys want to go bid on uh, Sarah's piece. It's on openc.io. Now tell us actually about the piece because it is a piece of art like that features you and it has some meaning behind it. Yeah. You know, um, it's really like my first fine art piece and, uh, it was inspired by the events that happened in 2020, um, between like our political climate and, um, all the social and civil unrest and the BLM protests and, um, you know, just, I felt like, I felt like our country and with the Statue of Liberty representing our country was feeling very hopeless. And I felt like, um, that we were asking for help, you know? So in the, in the, uh, piece, I am Statue of Liberty and I've slipped my wrist and, but I'm also reaching out for help. And, I think that 2021 has kind of like reached back and be like, okay, cool. We're here for you, Statue of Liberty, you know? Um, and yeah, it was just like a piece that I did. And I was like, you know, this looks really cool. And we, I want to do like something so much more with this, um, whether it can get some recognition or some people can see it because I think a lot of people are feeling like that in 2020, you know, like, uh, like, oh shit, like this is a bad situation that we're in this year, you know? So, um, yeah, I'm glad that we've kind of like pulled through and we got like our little wrist all bandaged up now, you know, we're kind of good to go for the moment, <laughs> but we'll always bear those scars. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, I want to ask you as a veteran performer, um, you know, I always like to have, uh, people with experience throw little nuggets of wisdom for, um, newbies in our industry. What is something that you know now that you wish that you had known when you first entered the adult industry? Um, something that I'd known now there's, Okay. So like one thing would be 
just to stay more organized, you know, there was, um, a couple, and I'm like an incredibly organized person now, but there's been like maybe three different times within the past 20 years where I had to be like, Oh shit, I'm not organized enough for what I'm about to do. Uh, you know, like paperwork and IDs and, um, just uh, file names and just having all your content really organized. I wish I would have been like, as anal retentive as I am about it now it, when I first started, because it's, it's a lot to catch up on when you have to play catch up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was fortunate that I, you know, started off in the industry working for my parents and I saw the kind of system that they had built and I followed along the same lines. You know, I keep all my content on multiple hard drives. Everything is labeled and has a shoot number. I have saved everything that I've ever shot from like the beginning of time. Yeah. So I have like everything and, you know, always kept my books super organized, always was so on top of my paperwork just because as a producer, that's what you have to do. Mm -hmm. And I've been hearing, um, you know, rumors that OnlyFans is now going to require model releases from performers. Um, which they should have been anyway, like, which they should have been anyways. Uh, yeah. But now like so many girls who like, you know, did content trade with somebody else and didn't mm -hmm. you know bother to get paperwork. Cause it was like a, you know, verbal agreement is now going to have to go back and, and yeah. get paperwork. And then that's such a bitch. I, I first experienced that in like, Oh six. So I'm like, yeah, like, why aren't you guys on track? Duh. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, reason why only fans and I'm sure many other platforms are going to be doing the same thing. It's because that visa and mastercard situation, you know, oh, yeah. like mm -hmm. if users are uploading content without uploading the model releases as well. There's no way for um, OnlyFans, Pornhub, ManyVids, any of these companies to uh, actually know that these people are of age and that they have released their image, you know? So have you, have you heard that rumor about MasterCard on October 1st that they're going to start requiring that? And I think this is really targeting the tube sites that all content uploaded has to have current IDs, meaning that if you shot somebody in 1980 and you got their IDs that were current at the time in 1980, yeah. they need to be current now in order for you to upload the content, which is insane. Okay. I have not heard that, but I'm going to debunk it as a rumor and false because that doesn't okay. even make sense. Like, how is that possible? No, like number one, doesn't. you can't go back. What if they're dead? But, like there's plenty of people that I've, I hate to say this, but there's plenty of people I've worked with that are dead now, you yeah. know? So what if they're dead? Number one, number two, like you can verify somebody's age by their old ID. Like yeah. if in, when the, the, if the scene was shot in 1984 and they were 18 in 1984, then they're definitely old enough. Like it doesn't matter how old they are now. I could care less. Or what if they move to Afghanistan and they don't even <laughs> have, you know, IDs anymore? Like, yeah. Yeah. Like I, that's, it, it's not possible. Like that's, that's what I thought too. Yeah. But I mean, I don't know if that's just MasterCard's way of trying to squeeze the adult industry, um, even more because, you know, more so than the government, like we're really held captive by the credit card processors. Yeah, sure. I think I, I was talking to my webmaster about it. Cause I was like, what the fuck? Cause I was yeah. like, you know, that I'm going to have to remove like 75% of my content. You know, my yeah, website's sure. been up for over 10 years. Mm -hmm. Um, and he says he thinks it's really aimed at the tube sites and it's not going to affect paid sites, but I really just don't think that that's, I don't think I don't, it's possible. And I don't think it makes sense. Like there, what's the justification there? Because if they were 18 on the day of the shoot, then they're over 18 now. So totally. who cares? No, yeah, I know it's crazy, but hopefully that won't, um, be an issue, but yeah, yeah, I read that yesterday and I was like, <laughs> what the fuck? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's not cool. Um, okay. Any other piece of advice that you would get, give a new girl looking to get into the industry? Be like very certain that you're happy doing it and you're like comfortable with your image being out there because it's like a tattoo, you know, it doesn't go away. It's, it's worse than a tattoo because now tattoos you can have removed, you know, but like you might think that you're doing like a, a little scene for like some little company that nobody's ever going to see. And then that company two years later turns out to be bang bros. You know, like I re I remember like reality Kings is like that for me. Like the first scene I did for reality Kings was just like, I happened to be on Florida on vacation and 
like some other thing, like some photography and stuff didn't like go through. And um, this girl called me and she was like, I've got somebody that could give you a little money for a scene. It was just like a little like bullshit scene in somebody's house, like real quick, you know? And I didn't even think anything about it. And it turns out like two years later, they're reality kings, you know? So yeah. Um, yeah. You never know. Like you need to be like fully certain that this is really what you want to do. And you're fully comfortable with your images, um, your explicit images being put online, you know? Yeah. Have you ever faced any real stigma because of what you do? Yeah. Like all the time, uh, from banks. I mean, like we get so much discrimination. Like uh, I've had my bank accounts closed. Um, I'm not allowed to Airbnb. I'm not allowed on dating sites. Um, and then, yeah, like I think companies and institutions probably give me more grief than like people because I don't keep those type of people in my life. Like I have a really nice positive group of people that are super supportive in my life. But yeah, like uh, when it comes to doing business and stuff, it's like I get blocked a lot. (laughs) That's so crazy. And it's, I mean, I've heard about the Airbnb thing and that is just like awful. And I, I guess they're, um, excuse would be, you know, people like renting out Airbnbs and shooting like for their website in there, which you can't do. Which but, that's totally you know. cool. I get that. And cut me yeah. off once I've done that. Don't like, I yeah. got cut off. I didn't have any violations. I'd only rented a place one time from Airbnb when they cut me off. Yeah. And it was like, I didn't do anything wrong. The people didn't complain. You know, they literally, yeah. when I tried to, because I tried to log in and it just wouldn't, work. It was just like, no. And so I, when I hit customer service, they had me send a, they would, they obviously do face recognition because they had me send a fa- forward like picture that, yeah. to the left, to the right with my IDs, with a newspaper. And, um, yeah, they were like, no, we're not opening your account again. <laughs> I'm like, but I didn't do anything wrong. Like, you know, even if I am a pornographer, totally cool. doesn't mean I'm shooting pornography in your place. doesn't mean that, you know, yeah. Like I, porn people, yeah. we take vacations too. <laughs> right. We take vacations and even like, okay, so I'm going to AVN. I take my entire crew with me. When I go to a convention, I take two cameramen. I take an editor. I take a makeup artist. You know, I take like a whole, and plus I take talent and we all need to stay someplace. Even if we're not shooting, you know, we're going every day to this convention and we ride together in the same van, you know? So it's like, it just is easier if we all stay together. And that doesn't mean that I'm shooting pornography there. Yeah. yeah. It's, <laughs> it's crazy. It's, it's, it's really a shame. Anyways, Sarah, thank you so much for coming on. It was such a pleasure to get to talk to you and, and get to know you. Absolutely. Um, can you, can you tell everyone where they can find you online? Yes. Um, I have a link portal, which will take you to everything Sarah J, whether you want merchandise or you want my social media or whatever content, et cetera. It's called sarahjlinks.com. And that'll take you to sarahj.com and all my social media. Fantastic. And you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. Of course, if you want to support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall unfiltered. Also, I joined TikTok. I caved. So go follow me there. It's Holly Randall unfiltered on TikTok and um, go watch my old ass. Try to keep up with the young kids. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you guys so much for listening. And again, Sarah, thank you so much for your time. Absolutely. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Bye. Since I've started working with Manscaped, they've really expanded on their product line. It's incredible. And if you get their perfect package, you will not only get ball toner and ball deodorant, but you will also get, of course, the electric trimmer, a shed travel bag, and their boxer briefs, which are the most comfortable boxer briefs. You can get all of this for 20% off at manscaped.com by using my code HRU.